And do people read your books in Nigeria? They do, shockingly. Tout à fait. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Are there bookshops in Nigeria? Are there bookshops in Nigeria? Are there bookshops in Nigeria? And uh, you also have several languages uh, in your novels. Uh, well, your novels, you, you, you write in English, the official language uh, in Nigeria. Uh, but uh, there are also the languages spoken in uh, Nigeria. Igbo, Yoruba. I hope I'm pronouncing this properly. And um, is it that wealth you grew up in which uh, makes you want to write with everything you have inside yourself? I, I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I speak only two languages, sadly. I wish I spoke more, but... Um, and I grew up, I grew up in Igbo land, so I grew up surrounded by Igbo speakers, and I grew up surrounded by Igbo culture, and um, I grew up in a university community, so it was very progressive and very English speaking, but it was also rooted in Igbo cultural norms, and, um, and I think those have shaped me. I think that there is a sense in which my sensibility is, is Nigerian, particularly, but it's also Igbo. There's certain things that are particularly Igbo, and it's, it's having been raised in, in um, southeastern Nigeria, where, um, yeah, where Igbo culture was, was kind of the norm. You went to the market and people just spoke Igbo to you automatically. Um, and you absorb these ideas, things like um, respect for elders. And, and of course, there's a lot I quarrel with. There's a lot about Igbo culture that that I want to change, that I, I want to push back on, and they're mostly things that I think are um, that are oppressive to women. But but in a large sense, I think my Igbo sensibility has shaped my storytelling. I um, and even the use of language. Um, I write in English because I was educated in English, and I can't really write. I mean, I can write Igbo, but I can't write. I can't make an argument in Igbo because I, I don't have the skills. But there is a sensibility from having been raised in an Igbo culture that I think shapes the way I tell my stories. And do people read your books in Nigeria? They do, shockingly. <laughs> they do. Are there bookshops in Nigeria? Are there bookshops in Nigeria? Are there bookshops in Nigeria? <laughs> Je vois, je vois, je vois, mais c'est précisément parce que... Yes, it's because you're reacting that way that I'm asking the question to feed into the next one. You were talking about sting, single stories. Now, when you talk about Nigeria, in France, unfortunately, there is not much said about Nigeria. But when people talk about Nigeria, it's about Boko Haram. It's about violence. It's about security. Now, I should like you to tell us something about Nigeria, which is different. Talk about it differently. And that is why I'm saying, are there bookshops? Of course, I imagine there are. But uh, I could ask the question uh, to the French. Do people read in France? I think uh, less and less so. You know, I think, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it reflects very poorly on French people that you have to ask me that question. <laughs> I really do. Because, I mean... Because I think surely, I mean, it's 2018, you know, I mean, come on. <laughs> um, my books are read in Nigeria. They are um, they're studied in, in schools, actually not just Nigeria, across the continent of Africa. And, and it means a lot to me because obviously I'm very grateful to be read everywhere in the world, but there's something about being read by the people about whom you write. Um, and some of my writing, uh, the people who sort of made stage plays of some of the stories in Nigeria. Um, when I wrote Half of a Yellow Sun, um, I remember doing my first event in Lagos and it was a full um, house. And it suddenly turned into people just arguing about history. 
and I sat back and I just enjoyed it. So people were throwing words at each other. And for me, what was wonderful was that literature has, had made this happen, that because of this contested part of our history, people had read this book and suddenly they were talking about it and they were disagreeing. But the point is that we're having a conversation and, and that conversation had been prompted by literature. And so I felt, um, it, I felt hopeful about it. Now what we'd like to have here, and there's less and less of it in France, uh, debates based on books. I, I, I'm very, I discovered race when I went to the U.S. I didn't think of myself as black in Nigeria. I thought of myself as Igbo. I discovered race when I went to the U.S. I didn't think of myself as black in Nigeria. I thought of myself as Igbo. I discovered race when I went to the U.S. I didn't think of myself as black in Nigeria. I thought of myself as Igbo. Um, so, so ethnic more than race. And then when I went to the U.S., I discovered I was black because suddenly people just said, oh, you know, you're black. But for me, the, the problem wasn't, um, and, and I think in talking about race, it's become important to me to clarify that the problem is not this being, you know, dark or black, because I think this is glorious. The problem is that there are people who, because of this, make assumptions and make, make decisions and make policy that we live in, that there's a history in which, um, and it's not just in the US where people were as actually constitutionally seen as three quarters of human because they were dark, but also that there are places in this continent where it's very hard for some people to imagine that you can look like this and be European. So, so I know so many stories of people who are asked, and I'm sure it happens in France, but I hear about it in Germany and Italy, where you look like this and people say, where are you really from? And your entire life you've been in Germany, and Germany is all that you know. But the assumption is, you know, where are you really from? But somebody who maybe had just come from Russia is not asked that because that person is white. So I think that race is, is sort of a, um, it's a thing that's very present, but also is supposed to not be present, so there's a kind of not wanting to acknowledge the, the, the reality of it. Um, I think, for example, that we need to have more honest conversations. I was talking to a woman earlier today who said to me that she doesn't think there's any racism in France. <laughs> and she wanted to talk about racism in America. And I find that this happens quite a bit in Europe where people ask me about racism in America and they don't want to acknowledge that there's racism in their backyard. And, and I, I think, and so, so what I, you know, I think one of the things to do would be, for example, to have more events in places like this where people of color feel that they're welcome. <laughs> because apparently it's remarkable. <laughs> so clearly there are many people of color who want to be at places like this, but nobody has made them feel that they're welcome. What do you think? What are you? What is your opinion as a, an intellectual, as an intellectual, on French diplomacy and French place in the world? <laughs> so, just your opinion. Um, I think, in general, that France doesn't seem to realize that it is no longer um, an 18th century world power. <laughs> And, um, and I say this with um, sad honesty because I have affection for, um, oh, the minister left, oh, okay, good. Uh, <laughs> but, but I mean, I think that, I think that the French, I mean, so I'm Anglophone African, I'm not Francophone, but I think that, that French, um, the history of French and Francophone relations, I find very vexed and troubling. Um, I, I think it's interesting this idea that the, 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 um, the CFA, the Francophone currency, is somehow tied to the French franc. I find that really retrograde. I think that um, the way that there's a kind of cultural power that France wields over Francophone Africa that I think is unhealthy. Um, I think francophone films are really French films in a way that that's not the case in anglophone West Africa. Um, there is a kind of, um, I think the way that anglophone Africans 
occupy this space in, in the UK is not the same way that Francophone Africans occupy this space in France. And, you know, and I, I think that Francophone Africans who, who, who know this, right, and maybe they should be the ones answering this question because, you know, I, do, I, I know sort of, I, I know I read a bit about it, but I, I obviously I don't have a personal experience. But I also think that um, France, now France has the, you know, France has sort of a, uh, a star president, um, the sort of French answer to Barack Obama, um, only not as tall, but um, <laughs> so maybe that's a good thing for France. I think that there are people who probably wouldn't have cared about France, but because France sort of has this new president who seems interesting and shiny, people are a bit more interested. <laughs> in France, but, but I should say that my criticism when I started out, and I stand by it, it's because I've had many unpleasant experiences with French immigration. Um, yesterday was different because they were actually polite, but every time I have come into France, and it's happened, I'm going to say four or five times in the past two years, that, that there is a kind of contempt with which I am dealt with when I present my Nigerian passport that I really find indefensible. And I think it's important because the immigration officers are the first line of, of, of contact with the country and so it shapes the way you think of a country. And I think it, it takes very little to be polite and to give people their basic dignity. And if I'm coming into a country and I have everything I need and I am legally there, then surely there's no reason to keep me for 30 minutes asking me ridiculous questions, ignoring me for long periods, and just being an ass. So that, that's what has shaped my um, irritation with, uh, yeah, I, I think it's important to, to remember that all human beings really deserve equal dignity. It shouldn't depend on the passport that we carry.